But uh, the Lord is uh, blessed, and I think it's been a good study, and we'll continue to go along until we finish, if the Lord willing. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask you to be with us tonight. We thank you for the testimony service and the Spirit of the Lord that witnessed to our heart, Lord. And we just praise you for God's people. Now we ask you just to be with us tonight. Draw us close to the throne of grace. And Lord, uh, just work in our life every day. Make us what you want us to be. And Lord, help us to seek you every day. To seek, Lord, your, your help, your guidance, your strength, your power. And Lord, help us to surrender our life to thee. Now, we pray that you'll just bless this service, that it'll be all that thou dost want it to be, and that we can praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I want to preach on the subject, the end of this present world. Radio preacher and false prophet Harold Camping made a prediction that the world would end on October 21st, 2011. He'd made predictions of the end of the world before. Of course, we know that the world didn't end. And I think Christians everywhere knew that it was not going to end. Because they knew that Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. And I even, I even heard uh, unsaved people remark, and even on the radio and uh, television places, I even heard unsaved people, uh, commentators remark that, you know, nobody knows the time the Bible says. They would say the Bible says no one knows the time of the end of the world. Well, I'm, think people, I'm thankful people know that much about their Bible. I'm thankful even unsaved people know that much about their Bible. Uh, the Mayan calendar was a concern for some because it ended December of 2012. And some were concerned about the world coming to an end <clears throat> then. Of course, we know that it didn't. Christians are to be watching for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible clearly teaches the end of the world is not close. And I, I think, you know, we have God's Word. We have this book that God has given to us. It is the book of truth. And we can be a settling voice in this world when, when people go off half-cocked and try to say to people, the end of the world is here. We can say to them with confidence and with truth that the end of the world is not close. Because the Bible tells us, I've been preaching through the book of Revelation, and it tells us there is at least seven more years to this, this church period. After that period of time, Jesus will come. He will defeat the armies of the Antichrist. He will set up his kingdom. And there's going to be a thousand year period and a little season after that before the end of the world comes. So when people get all upset and they say, well, the end of the world could be today or, or they give a date uh, at the end of the world, Christians need to say, no, no, because we need to study the Bible. We need to see what Jesus said about this. We need to see what the book of Revelation says about it. And the, and the book of Revelation says there is still time. This world is not going to end. What we do need to be concerned about is the coming of the Lord and being ready to meet the Lord when he comes. So uh, at the end of, of the the seven-year tribulation, and at the end of the thousand-year reign, some things are going to take place. First of all, the devil will lead a great rebellion against Christ, and he will be defeated. Uh, this present world will be burned up. The Bible says, you know, it was destroyed by water one time. It's going to be destroyed by fire the last time. The great white throne judgment will take place, and all the people of the world will be judged. People need to understand this. A judgment is coming. 
Not just for one or two, not just for a few folks, but judgment is coming for everybody. And a new heaven and a new earth will be created. That's what the Bible teaches. And so in our study of the book of Revelation, we're at the point when the great white throne judgment is going to set. And that's something that everybody needs to be concerned about. Because many people will not live, if we live on this earth, we're not going to live long enough to go to the great white throne judgment. That's, not, that's over a thousand years away. But we will be there. I believe, I believe with all my heart, and I'm going to preach on that a little bit tonight. I believe with all my heart that every person from the time of Adam all the way to the last person at the end of the world will be at the great white throne judgment. One, some will be there for judgment. Some will be there for other things. But every person will be there. First of all, this earth will end by being burned with fire. In Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now this will be the last day of this present world. We are told that at the end of the thousand year reign, uh, uh, there's going to be, uh, what's a th and the thousand years is the day of the Lord. Right at the time right after, the tribulation period, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom is the, is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a thousand years long. And the earth and the heaven, the Bible tells us, uh, after that period of time, uh, and the devil is defeated, there's going to be a judgment, and the earth and the heaven will flee away uh, and, and from the presence of Almighty God. In 2 Peter, Peter tells us, about this time. And let me read that to you. If you want to turn there, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. You, you need to see this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. I'll give you just a second to get there. We're talking about the, the true end of the world. The very last day when this, the, this present world is going to cease to exist. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. But let me reiterate again. That's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to be happen 10 years from now. It's not even going to happen 100 years from now. There are two last days in the Bible. There's the last day of the, of the church age when Christ comes and he, and he defeats the Antichrist and his armies and sets up his kingdom. That's the last day of the church age. And then the world will go on another thousand years and a little season. And after that time, the great white throne judgment will set. And, and Peter says about that day, the very end of the world, the, the second last day, he says here, beginning with verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Peter takes us from the time we are living in. Because even though Peter lived 2,000 years ago, he lived in the same dispensation we live in. He lived in the church dispensation. He was talking about that coming time, the day of the Lord. He said the day of the Lord uh, will come as a thief in the night. He was talking about uh, the time when the church age is going to end and the day of the Lord begins and the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom. That will last a thousand years. And then in that day of the Lord, he said, uh, at, and as I read it, at the end of that time, everything's going to be burned up. What a time that's going to be. What a time that's going to be when God says, my plan is over for this present world, I'm going to close the curtain on this present world. And there is going to be a judgment. The Bible teaches this world will end when God the Father comes to judge all of mankind. This is the greatest judgment that will ever take place. This is the time uh, when God is going to come and everything is going to be settled. Some people, some people ask the question, where's God? Some people say, well, why does God let this happen? Why does God let that happen? God has a plan. And he's working his plan. 
But there is going to come a time, my friend, when God's going to answer every question every man ever had in this world about himself. There's coming a time when God is going to call this world into judgment and every single sin that has ever been committed is going to be judged and every single thing that's ever been done that's right is going to be rewarded. God is going to judge every single human being that's ever lived upon planet Earth. You see... There is going to be the awfulest, the most terrible judgment that man can ever imagine. God is not dead. He's alive. God is not, he is not silent. He has spoken through his word. We know what's going to happen. Now we may get impatient we may not understand a lot of things that's going to happen. But the Lord has told us, first of all, folks, listen, the, what the thing we ought to be doing, the, the thing mankind ought to be concerned about is that every person will give an account to God for everything he's ever done or she. Jesus is coming. People say, where's the promise of his coming? Peter talked about that in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Where is? But God is not slack concerning his promises. He's well, he wants all men to repent. He's waiting and, he, and, he's, and the reason he allows wars and, and, and the reason he allows these atrocious things to go on that we see and we don't understand is because he's waiting. He's working his plan out because he's waiting for just one more soul to be saved. Oh, what people ought to be worrying about, what people ought to be thinking about, not worrying about, what people ought to be thinking about is what have they done with Jesus? Are they really saved? Do they really know the Lord of glory? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. I preached last week that... Uh, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You see, it's important to be saved. It's, a, it's the most important decision that a person will ever make in this life is to be saved, to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and to live for Him, to make Him his Lord, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look back, look back at verse 11 in 2 Peter chapter 3. Now this is the apostle Peter. This is, this is, this is Peter, the man who, who led the preaching of the apostles on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. This is Peter. And he says in verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Did he say, did he say just get by? Just step inside the gate? No, he said, there's a judgment coming. The most awesome, the most awful, the most awful judgment's ever taken place. We can't even imagine. I don't have any words to describe it. No one in this world has words to describe it. God has said we're going to judgment, folks, and we are going to judgment. Now, most of us will die, or, or we'll be raptured, we're taken up to be with the Lord, or, and if we die and we're saved, then we're going to, the graves are going to be open when the rapture takes place, we'll be taken up to meet the Lord. Hallelujah! But there's going to be a judgment. We are to live in peace and holiness to be ready. You know, people will accept Jesus Christ and live for Him or they will stand in judgment before God. You see, people need to understand the, mo the most uh, important thing in this world right now is to be ready to live for eternity. Oh, let me tell you, there's great benefits to serving the Lord in this life. We just heard people testify. The greatest thing about being saved is, is to go to heaven. The greatest thing about being saved is that God is walking with us. The greatest thing about, about being saved is a changed life. The greatest thing, we've all testified about how great Jesus is. And we haven't even scratched the surface. It's great to be saved, amen? And it's great to be saved right now. 
It's great to know the Lord, but my friend, let me, the most important thing that people need to understand, we get saved so we can go to heaven and we won't have to go to hell. The greatest thing, in the, the greatest thing about being saved is we're not going to stand in that great judgment because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah! Are you saved tonight? Are you living for the Lord? Secondly, at the end of this world, God will judge every person who has ever lived. Let me take you here in chapter 20, Revelation 20 to verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great. Not one. There's no, there's no fancy lawyers. You can't have enough money to get out of this judgment. And you're not too small for God to notice. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. I've, I've seen a lot of writings on what are those books. I'm not 100% sure about what all those books are, except I do know that an account is being kept of your life. Everything is recorded. Now, we have, we have computers today. Sixty, hundred years ago, if you'd have told people that there was such a thing, maybe farther than back then, I don't know when first people began to dream about computers, but if you'd have told people uh, back in the covered wagon days that there was going to be a time when every person on the face of this earth, their information could be fed into a little box, and a policeman could stop you on the highway, and within a matter of one or two minutes, he could have your whole life history. They, they, they just, they just, they'd have doubted that probably. Although some of them believed the Bible, they knew their time was coming when the mark of the beast was going to come, and they knew something like that was going to take place. But you see, the Bible tells us that there are books, a record, that God is keeping of our life. That's why it's so important to be saved. You see, when a person gets saved... The blood of Jesus Christ is applied to their, to their sins. And God wipes all that out. He forgives us of all. That's worth it. Amen? The Lord says, come to me. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord's invitation to lost sinners is to come. Because I'm here, I want to forgive you. I don't want you to go to judgment unprepared to meet God. I don't want you to go out into eternity unprepared to meet God. I've provided a sacrifice for you. I want you to be saved. I've done everything I can possibly do. God has done everything he can do to get people saved. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I can't imagine standing before a judge in this world. You know, there's a saying in, among people who know the law that a man who has himself for, a, 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 for a, an attorney is a fool. I can't imagine standing before a judge in this world without an attorney, someone to speak for me, someone who knows the law, someone who, someone who understands whether I'm being treated fairly or not. I don't know. I don't know the law that well. But you know, I certainly cannot, I cannot imagine standing before Almighty God and being judged on my works without Jesus there to say, He's accepted me. His name is, right here it is, it's in the, it's in the book of life. He was saved when he was 14 years old. He's mine. Oh, I tell you, to know Jesus that's what life is about. Let me read verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, all of humanity, all of humanity will be gathered before the judgment bar of God. God's throne is white. White represents the righteousness or holiness of God. After World War II, the Allied forces tried, after the war was won, the Allied forces tried 23 of the most prominent Nazis for the war crimes that they had committed. They called them to a place in Germany called Nuremberg. They took them there. There, there were, I believe there were eight judges. There were four judges and there were four alternate judges that were chosen from the, from the Allied countries. There were 12 judges there. And they, they had a trial. And these, these Nazis who had put Jewish people into, into these prison camps and, and had committed other atrocious war crimes were, were called up before the court. Their day of reckoning came. Now I'm sure that when the war was going on, they had no thought that they were ever going to have to stand and give an account of the terrible, terrible, terrible actions that they took. But we won the war, the Allied forces won the war, and they call those pro most prominent Nazis there and call them up, and they, they had trials for them, and sentenced them, 12 of them were sentenced to hang. Now, before, like I said, before that court convened, I'm sure these men never thought that they would have to stand and give an account of their life. There's people out there in the world today. And I got news for you. Those, those, those 23 people that were called before that court, some of them went to prison, 12 of them hanged. They're not done. Their judgment is not over. They're going to be raised and they're going to stand before Almighty God and give an account and God is going to judge them. Isn't that scary? Isn't that awesome? Shouldn't that, shouldn't that cause people to stop and think about the life that they're living? Shouldn't that cause people to stop and think about what kind of person they are? Shouldn't that cause people to seek the Lord? Because God says there's a way that you don't have to stand to that judgment. You can be saved. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sins. They're going to stand before Jesus. Can you imagine... Some of these people, how they've cursed Jesus. How they've done things to dishonor Him. How they've worked against His church. How they've tried everything in the world to destroy just the witness of the church and the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ standing before Jesus. The one who never told a lie. The one who never harmed anyone. The one who cared about everyone. The one who was put through the most terrible test that any person can ever go through in this life. And every time he did right. And what are they going to say? Well, I was under pressure. I, I, I was following orders. It won't wash in God's court. You see, they're going to stand before God. This will be the judgment of all those who are not written in the book of life. And the people of God will be there from all of history. They will be, I think they will be, and I, I, I don't know if they will play an active part, but I see the judgment seat of Christ. I know I'm, 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 I'm differing with some people here, and I'm just giving you my opinion. I believe the judgment seat of Christ takes place here. <clears throat> because you see, those who are washed in the blood are not going to stand in this judgment because the book of life is open. And those who have their names written in the book of life are not going to be judged here. They're going to receive their rewards. 
But I think when God judges lost people, those of us who are saved, I believe we will standing, be standing right behind Jesus. Now can you imagine one of those, can you imagine one of those Christians from Korea, North Korea that has been killed for his faith? And can you imagine Jesus sitting here at the great white throne judgment and he calls the person up that's responsible for that person's death and that person walks up there and here's the person or people he had killed standing right behind Jesus. And Jesus says to them, why did you do this awful thing? Why did you commit this awful atrocity? What are they going to say? Their mouths will be stopped. They will be dumb before God. There's no, there's no, there is no alibi. But I believe that Christians who love the Lord, who serve the Lord, that all of us will be right behind Jesus. He's the, he is the judge. He's the one who's going to judge. But the Bible says, you, don't you know the saints are going to judge the world? Hallelujah! You glad you're saved? See, everybody's going to be there. Those who don't know the Lord and, who've, and who have rejected the Lord, they're going to be out here in front of Christ. And they're going to be judged. The book of their life will be opened. And every single thing they have ever done from the time they took their first breath, what's the abortionist going to say? You see, every single thing, every little act will come into judgment before God. Every sin will be judged. I don't know how long it's going to take. It may take a thousand years for that judgment. I don't know. Time won't matter then. And then they're going to hear those awful words. Depart from me. You workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Never again to have the opportunity. There is no second chance. There are some groups who teach that, you know, if you can make it in the millennial, there's going to be, let me tell you, there is no second chance. And isn't that wonderful, the grace of God? How long he waits. There was a time, you know, around, people come to the age of accountability around 12 years. It was before that for me. I knew I ought to get saved before I was 12 years old. And God waited on me, let's say from about 10 to 14. Waited on me to get, the grace of God, isn't it wonderful? And God gives some people, I, uh, someone told me about a lady who's 99 years old got baptized. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You talk about the grace of God. 99 years he waited on her to get saved. Maybe he's been waiting on you for a long time. The Lord loves us. You see, some people look at the judgment and they say, well, how can, how can God be that cruel? And it's the same purple people who will say, well, how can God let something like this go on? God don't let it go on. He keeps a record. He'll settle. And there won't be any mistakes in the justice of God. And for those who will come, boy, I just wish everybody could be saved. Amen? And I know some people do some awful things. And I know that sometimes they hurt people in, 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 in terrible ways. But you know, they, they still have the opportunity. Even all the terrible things they've done, they still have the opportunity, the same opportunity I have to come to Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse them from that sin and they can go to heaven. And praise God, we'll be glad. Amen? The grace, the wonderful grace of my Lord Oh, we need to just stop sometimes and just think about how good God is. We need to stop sometimes and just think about how powerful and how wonderful 
His grace is. Are you saved tonight? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Why not? Why will you die? Why will you go through the second death when God has made a way that you don't have to? Because He loves you. Just like He loves me. The last thing. When the judgment is over, those who have their names in the book of life will shine as the stars forever. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever and ever. Did you get that? Soul winners? Amen? They that turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever, Daniel says. Man, we ought to be telling everybody about Jesus. That's our privilege. What greater privilege can we have in this life than to, let, than to lead someone else to Jesus Christ and know because we witness to them, it's God who saves them, it's God who does everything in their life, it's God who uses us, but to know that God used us in such a way that some other person is going to spend eternity in heaven. Hallelujah! What's holding us back? And God is going to bless those who, who win souls. All through eternity. Let me read it again. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise, it, first of all, if you read that chapter, it talks about the Jewish people, but I believe this applies to everybody. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteous as the stars forever and ever. I go out at night. I can remember one of the first things when I began to think about God as a little boy. I remember several nights. My dad would work in the summertime. He, would, he was a farmer. He'd work late at night. Had an old WD-45. Well, that was a WD. WD, uh, Alice Chalmer tractor. And had lights on it. And so when he, he was behind in his planning and... Uh, he took me to the field. I was just a little boy, five, five or six years old. <clears throat> and I'd lay there in that, in, that, uh, in that wagon where the seed was. And I'd get sleepy. And I'd lay down on my back and look up and see the stars. Wow. How beautiful. If you're ever down, go out and look up. Look at the stars, the beauty God has placed there. I didn't know, I didn't know then that the stars that I were seeing were probably suns like ours. I just knew it was beautiful. And I used to lay there on my back and think, man, Jesus put all those stars up there. He must be something. He is something. You know what I've learned? He is something. You know, I've, I've been disappointed in a lot of people. But I've never been disappointed in Jesus. <laughs> I've had some arguments with him. I always lose. <laughs> and I'm glad he always wins. Amen? But how great is our God? How wonderful. How wonderful is our Jesus that he loved us enough to come and die on the cross to save us. But to look up at the stars, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sight. And the Bible says that those who are saved, after the judgment is over, however long it takes, are going to shine forever and forever and forever. Uh, why? Tell me why. People don't want to belong to God. Why? Why are people, to content, why are people to content to live in a life of sin when Jesus could forgive them of that sin and deliver them from that life of sin and they could be saved and go to heaven? Why? 
hear us talk about <clears throat> going on a cruise. Lord willing, I'm going to go this year. It's a Christian cruise that we go on, not one of these where they drink and all that stuff, because when we get on the boat, it's all Christian, except for the workers, and I guess there's a few there, I don't know, but uh, most of the, most, almost everybody on that cruise is a Christian. No gambling, no drinking, the bars aren't open, it's just a place that you're on a boat, and it's about the closest thing to heaven I've found on this earth. Gospel singing every day. Southern gospel by good groups that sing the gospel. You can, and you can pick the one you want to hear. Every day, every night. And praise God. Great preaching. I mean, the best preaching I've ever heard. You get on that boat and they preach. Every one of them preaches out of the King James Bible. It's just, it's just, it's, I don't know, five days, whatever, we're on that thing. Not enough, I'll tell you that. We're on that boat and it's just, it's just almost like heaven. And I tell people about it and they say, oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not getting any money for this, okay. I'm not pitching for the gospel. I'm pitching for heaven. But you know, I think about that, and heaven is going to be so much more. Why? Why would someone let the devil tell them there is no God? The, the most foolhardy. I don't call, the Bible says don't call anybody a fool. We ought to be careful about names, name calling. Be careful about our language. Upgrade your language. Amen? I can't listen to what I used to listen to on the radio. It's gone. They want to use the Lord's name? Sorry. They don't need me. And I don't need them. From the time I was a little boy, even Christian people's language has come down to talk about things we shouldn't use, words we shouldn't use. Read the Bible and see how it discusses a lady who's with child. Talk about it like the Bible talks about it. Amen? Clean up your language. You're, you're, you're a witness for the Lord. You don't have to use that garbage. And, and Christian men who think that, that, okay, it's okay, I'm a Christian, and just to show my manhood, I can use some four-letter words, get it out of there. Jesus never used a four-letter word. You don't need it. But why? The Bible asks the question. Jeremiah, Brother Cody? Brother Ezekiel, I'm, why will you die? One of them, huh? Ezekiel, why will you die? What is it that causes people to not understand that it's a long way out there, but life is short? And what we do in this life will decide whether we, at that great day, that great day when God is going to judge the whole world, our name will either be written in the book of life and we'll be standing, if I'm right, we'll be standing behind Jesus as he judges the world. Or we'll be standing in front of him being judged. Oh, our God is so good. Our God is so great. Don't you ever, don't you ever let somebody put a doubt in your mind about Jesus? He's real. Don't you ever let someone tell you that he's just a man. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross. He shed his perfect blood. He died. He, he lay in the tomb three days and three nights. And he arose. Amen. And he's coming back. And I want to go on the first load. Because if you go on the first load, 
The second death has no power. <laughs> That's good, amen? amen? Hallelujah. I hope you're on that first love. But my friend, don't you ever let people tell you that God is not watching and that he does not see every sin because out there, coming, after that tribulation period, after that thousand years, God is going to wait that every single person from Adam to the end of the world will stand at the judgment bar of God. Let's pray. Our Father.